I'm so excited about the series that we find ourselves in. Uh, we're in the middle of our Mission Possible series, and we've been taking some time to discover sort of the what, if you will, what is it that God has called us to? Uh, we spent a few weeks on that. We, we just came through the story of Jonah and uh, looked at his life and, and the, you know, the, the experiences that he had as God had called him to do something great. And, uh, and so we talked about Bible Fellowship Church and what, what it is that God has called us to. And then a couple of weeks ago on our Celebration Sunday, we talked about our how. How are we going to accomplish the things that God has called us to? And I want to spend the next few weeks um, talking about the why. Why do we do what we do? What is the motivation behind it? What motivates us to go out and participate in mission together as a church? If you remember a few weeks ago, we talked about this idea that America needs another great awakening, that we are in the midst of a tremendously challenging time as a people, as a nation, and in our world. And we are in desperate need of God to move once again among the people of this nation and of this land. And we are in need of another great awakening. And I really believe that we are on the cusp of something tremendous as God is going to do some great work here in our valley and in our county, in our state, in our nation, in our world. And so we want to be ready and be participating in that mission together. And so we're going to spend some time over the next few weeks looking at a story, at a parable uh, that is the most famous, the most, uh, the most taught on, the, the, the most well-known parable that Jesus ever told. And so um, would you join me in prayer? Let's just ask that God would bless this time. Lord, we want to come to you today and we want to ask God that you would just bless the morning. Lord, would you bless this time as we prepare to open your word? Would you speak to us today, Lord? We are desiring to hear you speak. And so we're asking God that you would just speak to us. Would we hear your voice today, Lord, as we read your words, as we read this tremendous story, this wonderful illustration of the love of God? And so we're asking God that it would stir within us a, a renewed passion and a renewed sense of who you are and what it means to be called a child of God. And so I'm praying today, Lord, that this mission, the mission of Bible Fellowship Church would not just be the church's mission, but that it would be each of our missions, that we would, that we would adopt it into our lives, that it would permeate everything that we do, that it would become who we are and what we do as believers. As we live out our faith, Lord, in this world, as we seek God to tell others about you, as we worship you, Lord, and as we love in the way that you have loved. And so would you bless our time today, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So when Einstein, Albert Einstein, fled Nazi Germany, he came to America and he brought, or he bought, I should say, he bought at this old two-story home within walking distance of Princeton University. And there he entered, or he, I'm sorry, there in that home he entertained some of the most distinguished people of his day. You can imagine people wanted to go to Albert Einstein's house. And he discussed with them issues as far ranging as physics to human rights. But the story is told that Einstein had another frequent visitor to his house. She was not in the world's eyes an important person like his other guests. She was a 10-year-old girl named Emmy. Emmy heard that a very kind man who knew a lot about mathematics had moved into her neighborhood. And since she was having trouble with her fifth grade arithmetic, she decided to visit the man down the block and see if he would help her with her problems. Einstein was very willing and he explained everything to her so that she could understand it. He also told her she was welcome to come any time that she needed help. Well, a few weeks later, one of the neighbors told Emmy's mother that she was often seen entering the house of the world-famous physicist. Horrified, she told her daughter that Einstein was a very important man whose time was very valuable, and he couldn't be bothered with the problems of a little schoolgirl. And then... She rushed over to Einstein's house, and when Einstein answered the door, she started trying to blurt out an apology for her daughter's intrusion for being such a bother. But Einstein cut her off, and he said, she's not been a bother to me. 
He says, when a child finds such joy in learning, then it is my joy to help her learn. Please don't stop Emmy from coming to me with her school problems. She's welcome in this house anytime. You know, I was thinking about that story, and that's how it is, by the way, with God. From, from, and from its very opening pages of the scripture all the way through to the end of the book, the Bible, the overarching theme of the Bible is this. It's the story of how God has pursued us with an unchanging and an unquenchable and an undeserved love because he wants all of us to come to his house. Listen, we're, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 15 today, and we're going to be looking at that famous parable, the parable of the prodigal son, the lost son. I want to tell you that I don't think it's a, this is just the parable of the prodigal son. This is the parable of two prodigal sons, okay? But there's some background that I want to talk about here as we get into this story. And so if you have your Bibles, I really encourage you to open them to Luke chapter 15. We're going to be looking at this story together starting today and in the coming weeks. And this story uh, starts off there in the beginning of Luke chapter 15 with Jesus sitting down with a bunch of sinners, a bunch of outcasts, people who uh, shouldn't normally be associated with someone of great stature or someone of great wealth or of great value or of a great teacher. In fact, Jesus was being judged by the religious elite because there he was among the sinners. And there in that place, Jesus begins to tell some stories. In fact, there's three stories that he tells in Luke chapter 15. The first story is the story there you'll see of the lost sheep. He describes a, a, a little lost sheep that had wandered away from the flock. He had left the 99 and the great shepherd, the shepherd who loved every single one of those sheep, he went out to find the lost sheep. And you get the picture that he, he went and he traversed Great, great distances. He, he, he traversed, you know, rivers and creeks and canyons and all of these things. There was no distance too far. There was no obstacle too big that he would not go and bring back the one lost sheep. And so there we see the story of the lost sheep. The shepherd leaves the 99 and he goes in search of the one. And he finds the sheep. He brings him back to himself and he rejoices. Look at the very first verse there in Luke 15, if you have your Bibles. In Luke 15, it says there that now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathered around to hear him, to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and he eats with them. It was an accusation against Jesus. How could this guy associate himself with these people? And these Pharisees were walking around with their chests puffed out. They were the religious elite. They were the ones that would wear their ties to church on Sunday morning. They were the ones that had the biggest Bible, that had their Bible all marked up. They had notes everywhere. They were the religious elite. And they saw Jesus hanging out with these sinners. And they, their chests got puffed up. And they looked down across their long noses at Jesus, and they condemned him. This man welcomes and eats with them. How can it be? And Jesus, in verse 7 there, he says, I tell you that in the same way, he says, talking about the sheep, he says, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not repent. Then he goes on to tell the story about a woman who had 10 coins, and she loses one. And so 10% of her wealth is gone. And you get the idea that this coin was a special coin to her. Not only did it represent a good portion of her wealth, but it represented something really special. And she tears apart the house. I mean, you get the picture that she's pulling up the boards on the floor to see if it had fallen in the cracks. And she tears up the whole house looking for the lost coin. And she's frantic, and she's looking, and she's searching. And, and there in the night, you hear a cry out, and out loud. You hear her screaming, I found the coin. And she's running out in the street. She's telling all her neighbors, hey, listen, I lost my coin, but look, I just found it. I was frantically looking, and I looked everywhere, and there it was, and I found it. And she's celebrating, and there's this great celebration that takes place 
as she finds the coin that was lost. And Jesus again says in verse 10 of Luke chapter 15, he says, in the same way I tell you, there will be rejoicing in the presence of the angels of, of God over one sinner who repents. And then we get to the, the last story here in these succession of stories as Jesus is talking about the one that is lost. And so I want to read this with you. This is in Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 11. So let's read this story together. The Bible says there in verse 11, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. And so he divided his property between them. And not long after that, the younger son got together all he had. He set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. And after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. And so he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired men. And so he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son. He threw his arms around him and he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. Years ago, there was a, uh, a conference that was taking place, a, a comparative religious conference. And the wise and the scholarly were in a spirited debate about what was unique about Christianity. And someone suggested what set Christianity apart from other religions was the concept of the incarnation. It was the idea that God took human form in Jesus. But someone quickly said, well, actually, other faiths believe that God appears in human form. Another suggestion was offered, what about the resurrection? The belief that death is not the final word, that the tomb was found empty. Someone slowly shook his head. Other religions have accounts of people returning from the dead. Then as the story is told in this place with all these scholars, C.S. Lewis himself walks into the room. He's wearing a tweed jacket, a pipe, arms full of papers, a little early for his presentation there, and he sat down and he took in the conversation, which had by now evolved into a fierce debate. Finally, during a lull, he spoke saying, what's all this rumpus about? And everyone turned in his direction, trying to explain themselves. They said, we're debating what's unique about Christianity. Oh, that's easy, answered Lewis. He replies, it's grace. Well, the room fell silent. Lewis continued that Christianity uniquely claims God's love comes free of charge. No strings attached. No other religion makes that claim. After a moment, someone commented that Lewis had a point. Well, Buddhists, for example, they follow an eightfold path to enlightenment. It's, it's not a free ride. Hindus believe in karma, that your actions continually affect the way the world will treat you. And then there's nothing that comes to you not set in motion by your actions. Someone else observed that the Jewish code of the law implies that God has requirements for people to be acceptable to him. And in Islam, God is a God of judgment, not a God of love. You live in that religion to appease him. At the end of the discussion, everyone concluded that Lewis had a point. Only Christianity dares to proclaim God's love is unconditional, an unconditional love that we call grace. Christians boldly proclaim that grace 
really has precious little to do with us. Our inner resolve, for, or our lack of inner resolve, rather grace is all about God and God freely giving to us the gifts of forgiveness, of mercy, and of love. So God loves, God's love for us is, is unconditional. It is as Philip Yancey once wrote, there's nothing that we can do to make God love us more, and there is nothing that we can do to make God love us any less. You know, as I, as I contemplated these stories that Jesus told, the story of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and then the lost boy, many have, have talked about it. Who are the main characters? What is the main point of these stories? And some would say, well, the main point is the lost boy. It's the one who was lost and was found. Some might say, well, no, actually, I think the main point was, was the boy that we're going to read about in the coming weeks, the boy who, was, who stayed home, who was faithful to, to his father, so to speak, and who didn't uh, abandon his dad and, and was there. Maybe the point is that boy. I want to make an argument this morning that the point of these stories is not the lost sheep, the lost coin, or the lost boy. The point of the story is the one who goes looking for them. The point of the story is the love of the Father, as we read about it here in this story. And so we see this story play out as, as the young boy there in verse 11, it says there that Jesus continued, he says, there was a, a man who had two sons. And the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. And so he divided his property between them. And so we see here in this story this, this boy, this boy who's young, and he comes to his father, and, and in, a, in a bold and in a daring and in a disrespectful way, he says to dad, Dad, I am sick and tired of living in this house. I'm sick and tired of you telling me what to do. I'm sick and tired of being here in this place. I want what's coming to me. Give me my inheritance. Give it to me now. I can't wait. For you to die. Just give it to me now. And so surprisingly, shockingly, there it is. The father, he responds in an unconventional way. I mean, it's incredible. It's actually shocking what happens here in this story. The father doesn't condemn him. He doesn't say, what in the world is go up with you? I mean, why would you come to me and say such a thing to me? That is the most disrespectful thing I can think of. Get out of my sight. In fact, leave my home. Don't ever come back. I'm disowning you. Of course, I'm not going to give you half of, your, my, half of my wealth and the inheritance coming to you. What kind of a son are you? You disrespectful, ungrateful, little whatever. Get out of here. But shockingly... That's not what the father does. Shockingly, the Bible says that the younger son said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. And then as Jesus records this story, as he tells it, he says, so he divided his property between them, between the older and the younger. He gave the boy just what he had asked for. You see, the point of these parables is not about the boy. I don't think it's about the boy, although they are sort of supporting characters, if you will. There are some things we can learn about them, but the point of the story is about the father. It's about the love of the father. And the reality is this, is that God is love. And the points of these parables is simply that, that God is love. And the story is a story written to those who are down and out. It's a story written to the outcasts. The audience that is there, as Jesus tells the story, is a mixed audience. We saw that it's a collection of tax collectors and, and sinners. They had gathered around him. And then there were those religious elite that were there listening as well. The Bible says, and John records these words in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. He says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. And whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. And this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his son and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not 
that we loved God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. God is love. That's the point of these stories. In fact, the story goes on as the father divides up his estate. He gives the son exactly what he's asked for. He gives him his share of the wealth. And you get an idea that dad was not just an ordinary man. He was a wealthy man. And so when he divides up his property, the son in a moment becomes wealthy. And Jesus goes on in the story in verse 13. It says, not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had and he set off for a distant country and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. Listen, when a kid goes off to college, <coughs> they don't often just pack up everything they have, right? I mean, when they go off to college, they'll take the necessities. They bring their clothes and of course the cell phone, that's got to be first. They bring the cell phone, they bring their clothes. Oh, don't forget the charger because you're in a lot of trouble if you get that. And so they, they bring all of these things, right? But there always is stuff left behind. They don't bring everything they have. Well, this boy, and, and by the way, why do they not bring everything they have? Because they plan to come home. There's a plan to come back home. I'm going to come and retrieve these things someday later when I'll need them. And for those of you that are grandparents or, or you have grown children, maybe you still have things in your home that belong to your kids, okay? And they're there because they plan to come back. And it's a safe place for them to be. Well, this boy had no plan on coming back home. He had written dad off. He, he had said, I wish you were dead. I'm going to go live my life now. And the Bible says there, Jesus says that, he got together everything he had. He wasn't going to leave one thing behind. No picture, no shoes in the closet, no clothes, nothing on the bed. Everything was getting packed up and moved out. Dad, I'm done with you. I'm never coming back again. And I'm not leaving one thing behind. And so he packed everything up. Jesus says he had no plan of coming back. And he set off for a distant land, a distant country, someplace far away, somewhere where the grass was greener, someplace where he thought it's going to be amazing there. I mean, it's been so terrible living here with dad, but man, I'm going to a place that is incredible. I'm going to Las Vegas. I mean, boy, it's amazing there. I've, I've heard about the lights. I've heard about the parties. I've heard about the stuff. I mean, it's incredible. I'm going to go there. And boy, life is just beginning for me. This is going to be amazing. What a life I have ahead of me. And the Bible says there he squandered his wealth in wild living. Jesus paints the picture that he lived it up. He had parties every day. In fact, his, if his name was Joe, right, people would be like, oh, you guys, we got to go to the pub tonight. Joe's there. He always buys drinks for everybody. Let's go, you know. And so they hit the pub, and there Joe is, and he's like, hey, drinks on me, you guys. And it's a party every night. When Joe shows up, it's a party. And so there he is partying it up, living it up. The Bible says he squanders his wealth in wild living. Everybody knew him. He did everything. He was with everybody. He tried everything. He drank everything. He smoked everything. He, he slept with everybody. He lived it up. I mean, he was the life of the party. And he was enjoying life. And Jesus says, and there in that distant land, in that place like Las Vegas, if you will, he squandered all his wealth and wild living. And boy, did people love old Joe. Man, Joe was such a fun guy to be with. I mean, if we're going to have a party, we better invite that guy. I mean, it's going to get 10 times better when he's there. But then one day, Joe shows up at the pub and he says, hey, guys, drinks on me tonight. It's going to be a great night. You know, and he pulls out the credit card. He goes to the bartender. The bartender swipes the card and it gets denied. And he says, oh, well, that, that can't be right. Here, try this card. Try this other one. Swipe. Denied. 
Oh, oh, wait a minute. What, what's going on here? What, what's, here, here, try this one. I know there's money left on this one. Swipe. Denied. Joe had squandered all of his wealth and wild living. He had nothing left. And with it, all his friends went too. In the world that he thought was the best, in the place that he thought he'd find the most friends and the happiest, when the money was gone, so were the friends. And so it says there, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country. And for the first time in his entire life, he began to be in need. Joe grew up in a home where he didn't have any needs. He had the nicest clothes. He had the nicest place. He had servants. He had everything. Dad gave him half of his wealth. He went out a rich man. He spent it all. And he finds himself a drunk, sleeping on the streets, a homeless man. And for the first time in his life, he's in need. And so in that desperate place, in that dark place, Jesus says, so he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. And he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. This was the rich man's son. This was the one who would never find himself in a pigsty feeding pigs. In fact, that was just not only that, but this was so beneath a Jewish wealthy man to be there in the midst of those pigsties feeding the pigs and longing because he's so hungry to eat the pods that the pigs are eating. But even the owner of the pigs wouldn't allow him to even eat the pig food. And there he finds himself in that place. No one giving him anything. He's broke. He's homeless. He's destitute. He's friendless. He's all alone. And he's far from home. And so we see the story here play out. As he comes to his senses, the Bible says. And we see the picture of the love of God. The love of God has no bounds. The love of God can reach down to the very darkest and deepest of places. It can go all the way down even to the bottom of the pit. I was reminded of when Katie started kindergarten. This was quite a few years ago, and, and she was over at Batista Creek, and it was a big day for us. And so, you know, as parents, when you send your kids off to kindergarten, it's a big day, you know, and and it was, a, it was an exciting day. I mean, we were excited, you know, and a lot of moms are crying. I mean, it's part of that, that, the whole process, you know. It's like, my baby's going to school, and they're crying and whatever. It's an emotional time. And so we're there. Tammy and I are there dropping Katie off at, at kindergarten, and she's super excited to be there. You know, she's very outgoing. And, and we walk into the kindergarten room there, and, you know, the, the room is set up with little colored squares all on the floor, and, and they've got little stations and all those things like a kindergarten room is, and there's kids sitting around playing and doing things. And, and Katie runs into the room, and she's all excited. And, and, uh, and I think Tammy's anticipating this emotional experience, but Katie's not sad at all. I mean, this is, her, this is the big day for her, right? She's, she's not going to let us be sad. She's like, we're going. And, and she's excited, and there's kids. And, and we walk in the room, and there's a little boy. And I'll never forget this. There's this little boy sitting in one of the colored squares. His mom had dropped him off earlier, and she had gone. And I think this was probably true for most children. The teacher has to tell the mom, okay, you, you can leave now. It's okay. He's, they're going to be okay. And the mom was gone, and there he was sitting on that colored square, just bawling his eyes out and weeping. And Katie runs into that room in her bubbly personality, and she looks around, and she sees that little boy over there. And she runs right over to that little boy. And she sits down and begins to play with him on that little carpet square. And then she runs back and she says, hey, mom, dad, can, is it okay if I stay and play with this little boy? And we said, yeah, sure, it's, it's totally fine. So she goes and sits on the carpet square again with him. And we overhear her say to this little boy, she says, hi, my name's Katie. I'll be your friend. And she became his friend that day and they sat and played and the tears dried up. And listen, that's the story here that we're reading. It's the story of a God who's coming down and saying, hey, I'll be your friend. I'll be your friend. In Romans chapter 8, verse 35, we, we get a picture of this love, this love of God. And it says this there, it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? He says, As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long, and we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. 
No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced, he says, that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us from that love. And so the boy there is in the pig's sty, feeding the pigs, hungry, homeless, filthy, dirty, in the lowest place he could have ever imagined in his life, probably even lower than he could have ever imagined. No friends left, no money left, everything is gone. The future is bleak. And Jesus says that in verse 17, when he came to his senses, by the way, I find this interesting, he didn't all of a sudden start feeling guilty. He didn't all of a sudden say, you know, wait a minute, I, 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 you know, I messed my dad over. Man, I'm a jerk. I, I shouldn't have done that. No, the, the Bible says he came to his senses, and this was the thought he had. He says, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. And so he came to his senses. He didn't feel guilt or sorrow. He just simply realized that his father treated his servants better than this, better than this pigsty that he found himself in. And by the way, when the Bible says hired men, you get the picture of day laborers. These are not the servants that, that were brought into the house. These aren't the servants that lived among the family members. These are day laborers. These are the ones that you go down to Home Depot and you find there in the parking lot and you ask them if they can come, if they'll be willing to work for a day. He says to himself, he says, my father's hired men have it better than me. And he came to his senses and he sat there and he thought to himself, I can do better than this just by simply being a day laborer in the village where my father lives. My boss, when I was working public safety in, in, at Cal Baptist, he had a sign over his door. And I, I think I might have shared this with you, but the sign was on the inside of the door. So you didn't see it when you walked in, but the sign read this. It said, everyone brings joy to this office. Some when they enter and some when they leave. And so th there you go. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so uh, I, thought, I saw that sign when I thought, boy, that's good. I wonder which one I am. Every, am I bringing joy when I come in or when I leave? And, and you know what? I imagine that's what the boy thought. He thought, well, if I show up, it's not going to be a joyful day. When I left, it wasn't joyful. And when I show up, it's probably not going to be joyful. And so he starts to think to himself, but maybe, just maybe, I can go back to the village and become a day laborer. I can go to my father and say, would you hire me to work for a day's wage? Because my father, I know, is a good man, and he would pay me a day's wage. And then I could have something to eat, something to live on. I won't, be fi I won't find myself in this terrible place. Look at verse 12. Look at what he says to his father the first time. He says, he says Father, give me my inheritance. And the father, in his great wisdom and grace, gives it to him. And then later on, when he finds himself in this lowest of places, look at what he says. He says in verse 18, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And I would underline this if you're taking notes. He says, make me like one of your hired men. The story begins with the son saying to the father, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me my inheritance. Give me what's coming to me. Give me all this wealth. Give me all this riches. And, and the father in his great wisdom and in his great love and kindness, he gives it to him. And the son gets himself into a deep and dark pit. And he comes to his senses, the Bible says, and he gets to the place where he says, I'm just going to go to my father. And instead of saying, give me, I'm going to say, make me. Would you make me one of your hired servants? And so the love of the Father is fully realized when we humble ourselves and we say, make me. Would you make me? How many of your prayers are characterized by this statement? How many of us come to God and we're constantly saying, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me? 
when the Father is just simply waiting for us to get to the place in our lives where we say, where we no longer say, give me, but we just say, okay, God, I'm here in this place. I'm desperate for you. Would you just make me? Would you make me one of your hired servants? And so the son is in this place. And he finds himself in this deep, dark place. And I imagine in his mind, he starts to think to himself, he's like, okay, <clears throat> I've got to confront my dad again. I don't know how this is going to go. I mean, I left in a really bad place. And so I, I've got to make my way back to the village. I've got to make my way back to dad. And, and you know what? I, you know what? Okay, I've, I've got a plan. I'm, I'm going to come up. I've got this. I'm going to come up with something to say really good. I mean, something really good to say. Okay, here, here it is. All right. Okay, father. Uh, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. Would, would you make me one of your hired servants? No, 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 that doesn't work. Okay. Um, okay, uh, here, let me, let me do it this way. Okay, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's, that's better. I mean, that's a lot better, actually. I mean, from what I did, I, okay. Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, would you make me one of your hired servants? Would you, would you just, could I be a day laborer? Look, I know I messed up. I mean, I messed up bad. I, I, I'm no longer worthy. Could you just make me a day laborer? I mean, I'm willing to work just for an hourly wage. I, could you just make me a day laborer? And the Bible says that as the boy made his way back, I imagine he's rehearsing the speech in his head. He's like, okay, okay, father, I've I've sinned against heaven in your sight. Okay, all right. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Would you just make me one of your servants? Okay, I think that's what, I think that'll be good. It'll be good. Okay, Wait, let me say it one more time so I get it right when I get there. Okay, uh, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Would you, would you just make me one of your servants, one of your day laborers? And so he's walking that long journey, that path back home from that far and distant land. But something amazing happens as he's walking back. There's, a, there's another character in the story, the main character that I would argue. And there we see the father. And so the Bible says in verse 20, it says, he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. Listen, I don't want you to miss this. I heard somebody talking about this, and they said, listen, that there's something incredible and powerful about the scene. As he saw him, the father saw him, which means that the father was looking for him. He was anticipating that he might just might come back home. Yeah, he had disowned me as his, as his father. Yeah, he took half the wealth. Yeah, he didn't bring anything with him. He took everything, but just maybe, just maybe he'll come back. And so every morning the father would get up, he would, he would put a cup of coffee uh, on and he would sit down on that front porch with his coffee and he would sit there and he would look off into the distance down that dusty road and, and every once in a while as he sipped his coffee, he'd see some dust coming up off that road and he would squint his eyes and he'd get up to the edge of the porch and he would look really intently and closely, is that my son? Is that figure my son? And as the figure got closer, he quickly would realize, no, that's not him and he'd sit back down. Day after day, week after week, month after month, this went on and on as the father hoped with great anticipation that his son would return home someday. And so as those figures would appear every once in a while on the horizon, hope would rise in him. He would get excited and he would walk to the edge of the porch and he would squint his eyes and, and he would look off into the horizon. And day after day, he was disappointed. Until one day, as was his routine, he sat down with his cup of coffee on the porch. And there he sat and he thought and prayed and hoped and wished that this would be the day that maybe his lost son would come home. And then all of a sudden he saw the dust kicking up on the road way down outside of the village. And he thought to himself, oh, maybe, maybe this is the day. And he gets up, he puts his coffee down and he, he peers off into the horizon and he looks and he sees a dusty figure peering through that dust and it's getting closer and closer. And he says to himself, he says, wait a minute. I recognize that gate. Wait a minute, I've seen that before. Wait a minute, I, I know that figure. I recognize that silhouette. Wait a minute, who is that? I, I think, could it be? Could it be my son? And then in a moment of extreme, un, and in an undignified way, this is what happens. Jesus says that he, 
while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, and he was filled with compassion for him, and he ran. Listen, I don't want you to miss this. When you're a wealthy old man landowner, you don't run. This man hadn't run since he was a boy. I mean, he wore the nice robes and had the nice rings. He had servants that would wait on him. But when he saw that dusty figure coming down the street, he couldn't help himself. He pulled up his robe, and in a completely undignified way, he began to run towards his son. And he ran, and I imagine the servants were watching this, and they're like, what in the world is Samuel doing? I mean, what's going on? Our master is running. I've never seen him run before. What is he doing? And he's running down the streets of that village. And he's running as fast as he can. And as he gets closer and closer, it's becoming more and more true. This is my son. He's come home. And he runs to him. And I imagine the servants are following him as he runs. And the Bible says that he ran to him. And he threw his arms around him. And he kissed him. Listen, the embrace that this boy received when his dad came to him is not a typical kind of an embrace. It wasn't a side hug. It wasn't a high five or a pat on the back. It wasn't a, well, it's good to see you, boy. It wasn't anything like that. And the boy is fearing that when he approaches the house, when he approaches the door, he's going to have to knock and someone's going to answer and it might be dad and dad might say to me, get out of here. I don't ever want to see you again, which would have been the natural response. You've wasted all my money, and look at you. Look at you. You look like a pile of trash, and you smell like one, too. Get off my porch. But no, the boy's walking. I imagine his head hung low. He's rehearsing the lines in his mind. Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Would you make me one of your hired servants? And there the father, in a completely undignified way, runs to his son through the village, down the street. The Bible says he throws his arms around him. It was a hug like no other. It was an enveloping hug. If you stood from a distance, you couldn't separate the two. You couldn't see where the father ended and the son began. There was just a hug that just encircled that boy and the muck that was all over that boy, the filth that was on his face, the the pig feces, the, the dirt, everything was now washing off onto the father as he hugged his son. And the son begins to speak which is really profound in my mind. I thought, well, okay, the father's enveloping him with this hug, and he begins to speak. He begins to rehearse and and say back the speech that he had given. He says, Father, Father, I've sinned against heaven, and in your sight, and then the father is hugging him. He's oblivious to the speech. He can't hear it. He doesn't know what he's saying, and he's shouting to everybody, hey, hey, my son who was lost, he's found. You guys, we got to have a party. Somebody bring me a robe. Hurry. Somebody get a robe. Get a ring. Put some sandals on his feet. Listen, this is incredible. And the son is rehearsing the speech, and the father begins to kiss him, and the Bible says he kisses him. And by the way, this is not just a little peck on the cheek. This isn't just a little hello, nice to see you kind of kiss. If you go back to the original language, this is a kiss of all kisses. It's a repeated kiss. He's kissing and kissing and kissing. You get the picture of like a little puppy. We have a little puppy at home, okay? When you get him excited, he's just going to lick and lick and lick and lick and lick and lick all over you. This is what dad is doing when he finds his lost boy. He's just showering him with kisses. The kisses just keep coming, and the boy is rehearsing the speech. I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And he's overwhelmed by the love of God, the love of the Father. As he's receiving all of these these hugs and all of these praise, and Dad shouting out to the servants, we've got to have a party, you guys. Listen, I've been waiting for this day for so long, and here he is. He ran to him. He threw his arms around him. He kissed him. He says, kill the fatted calf. We're going to have a party. And I want to ask you this question. Do you know this God? Do you know the kind of God that would envelop you in this way, that doesn't care about the muck and the mess in your life? Do you know him? Oh, the love that sought me. Oh, the love that bought me. Oh, the grace that brought me to his fold. And so the son rehearses his speech, and he doesn't have time to finish it. He can't get to the last line. Would you make me one of your hired servants? 
It doesn't even come out of his mouth because the overwhelming love of the Father just consumes him. And my question to you today is this. Do you know this God? Do you know that kind of love? The kind of God that is willing to throw his arms around you, to envelop you in a hug, to ignore your mistakes, to pay no attention to your filth, to love you unconditionally. You see, the love of the Father is beyond understanding. It's beyond compare. He loves you. He loves you with all that he has. And so this story is not about a prodigal son, but it's about the love of God. Paul describes this love in this way. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. I want to close by just reading a little poem to you. This is a poem that someone wrote, a gentleman by the name of Mark. I don't know his last name, but he tells the story this way. The story begins with a boy gone bad. Faces in the audience light up. The boy takes full advantage of his father, an ancient, kindly man. He wants the inheritance, everything. Faces grimace. An upstart, someone says, horse whip him. Teach him some manners. Some young men smile, but they all wait, eyes fixed on the face of Jesus. The father lets him go after giving everything. The whole inheritance, the gold, the silver, the favored horse, the treasured cloak, the ring, faces show surprise. How, his father's a fool, someone whispers. The son's a cheat, but they bend forward to hear. He spends it all on prostitutes, wine, gambling, the best clothes, loose living. An old man looks down at his friend and he winks. He should have invested it, he says. That's the wise way, but this one's a fool, the other says. Heads nod in agreement. Soon the boy hits bottom, nothing left. He ends up slopping pigs. Faces flinched, stunned, but some smile. He got, they say, what he had coming to him. He got what he deserved. This is a good story. But then the boy remembers home, the feasts, the plenty, the laughter. He sits and weep, weeps, his head on his hands. He decides to return home, and he asks for a bed in the barn. Someone laughs, a twist, he says. Faces show intrigue. The boy comes home, hands gritty, legs scarred. He's penniless, ragged, wasted, a scarecrow. Listeners are laughing now. Revenge, they think, the disowning. But no. The old man sees him on the road from his chair on the porch where he has sat waiting each day. He recognizes the walk, the long hair, the shoulders. He jumps up. He stumbles out to him, his heart thumping, his eyes wet. He runs to the boy while the boy stands there, his head down. The old man gathers him into his arms, and he holds him long, so long, and he weeps. Faces are stern now. Their eyes are slit. His father's a fool, they murmur, but still they wait. The boy begins his speech, but the old man has suddenly gone deaf. He throws a cloak over the boy's rags. He pulls off his last and his best ring, slides it onto the boy's finger, and he begins calling for servants. Kill the fatted calf, he shouts. We'll have a feast. Faces are hard now. Many shake their heads. A bitter elder son refuses even to speak to his lost brother. He stomps off, angry, cursing. Some faces nod, but most are gray. Their lips pressed white, their eyes aflame. The son stands up to go. Nothing has gone right in this story. They stalk off. A bad story, one says. Stupid, says another. Not one of his best. But some from the crowd linger. A prostitute. A tax collector. A thief. A liar. They glance at Jesus furtively, and they wait. Then they approach slyly, slowly, and one by one they fall at his feet, and they weep for joy. You see, this is how God has chosen to portray himself to us, a kindly, loving old man who no cruel word or deed can turn away, a worried father who refuses no request, who asks for no groveling, who keeps no history, requires no restitution, and who gives no lecture utterly without dignity, we see the same God 
being flung to die on a trash heap outside the city of peace. Without one single display of power or shred of dignity left, God himself was left to suffocate alone to bring his children back. Now that's not all there is to how God has communicated himself. God is not weak, nor will he be mocked, but the parable is astounding, and we ought to be astounded. And so my question for you today is, do you know this God? Why do we do what we do? Because God loves us, and he loved us first. Listen, let me pray for us. Lord, I, I just want to thank you, God, so much for the day. Thank you for this story. Thank you for being the kind of God that loves us. Thank you for being the kind of God that would, that would wait patiently for us. And that even in the midst of great, great ugliness, even as we are far from you, wrapped up and lost in sin, that you are there to accept us and to love us. I want to ask you a question today. I'm just going to ask you very pointedly. Do you know for sure that if you were to die today, that you would find yourself in heaven, at home, with this God? Maybe... As you sit and contemplate that question, you would say to me, Chris, listen, if I'm honest, I would tell you I want to be there. I want to be in that place, but I just don't know for sure. I have a lot of doubts. In fact, if I'm really honest with you, I would say, yeah, I don't know for sure. I want to give you a chance right now, today, if that's you, to give your life to Jesus. The Bible tells us that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so maybe today is the day that you come to God and you say, would you make me one of your servants? If that's you today, I'm going to give you a chance right now where you're sitting to give your life to Jesus. In fact, I want to just invite you to stand up. If that's you, if you're sitting there right now and you're thinking to yourself, that's me, I want to invite you to stand just right where you're sitting. Well, this is probably the most important moment in your life, and it doesn't matter what anybody else in this room thinks. This is between you and God. This is your chance to say, God, oh, thank you. I love you. And I'm giving you my life today. If that's you, I want to invite you to stand. Maybe you're listening online. I invite you to do the same. Stand or lift your hand up. And I want to lead you just in a simple prayer. And you don't even have to say it out loud. You can just say it in your heart to God. Just say, God, I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. I'm a sinner. I desperately need you in my life. Would you forgive me? Would you come into my life and would you save me? Would you be my Savior and Lord? I am committing myself to you today. The Bible says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, that we would be saved. It's a guarantee. And so this is your chance today. And if you've prayed that prayer, I just invite you to say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for coming into my life. Thank you for saving me. I pray for those that have prayed that prayer today, Lord. Would today be just a wonderful day? Would it be the day that they walk from darkness to light, from outside of the home, inside of the home, the day that they can finally call you Father? Just bless them today, Lord, we pray. And be with all of us too, Lord, as we seek, Lord, to continue to serve and to love in the way that you have. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.